Welcome everyone to this webinar. I'm Paula Kuhumbu and I've been teaching an undergraduate course to students from Princeton University and Columbia. I've been doing this every year for 11 years now. I have the uh, benefit of a wonderful teaching assistant, Matt, <laughs> Matt Babe, <laughs> who is a graduate student at Princeton University as well. And Matt is doing his own research in Gorongosa. Matt, do you want to say anything before we get started? Um, I think you covered it, yeah. I'm just working in, in Mozambique and excited to be helping out with this course and um, proud of what all the students are about to present. Excellent. So every year, Princeton students together with Columbia University come to Kenya for an entire semester to do a study course abroad working in ecology and evolutionary biology. And I teach a course in uh, community conservation. This year, because of coronavirus, the students had to return back to America ahead of time and so the entire course has been taught on Zoom and the students have been doing projects which they're going to present today. So uh, thank you everybody who has taken time to come and listen to these presentations. Students have worked extremely hard and they've been working on a challenge which was how do we make Kenya a superpower for biodiversity conservation. We have five groups, two, pair, two uh, students in each group and they're go we're going to start with Carolyn and Veronica. The floor is yours. All right, let me share my screen. And maybe if I could just say one thing for the participants, we're really happy for you to send us Q and A's. We will allow uh, four minutes of questions and answers at the end of each session. Any questions we don't get to, we will still respond to later on. Okay. All right. Can you guys hear us and see the screen, Paula? So Carolyn, whenever you're ready. Great. So hi, I'm Carolyn. And I'm Veronica. And six weeks ago, we were living in Kenya amongst the beautiful flora and fauna. We were living in Lakipia as a part of the Princeton Columbia Study Abroad Program at the Impala Research Center. We sequenced the genomes of the white and black rhino at Oljogi flew to Turkana to search for four million year old fossils and scoured the archives of the Nairobi's National Museum for the bones of animals that went extinct long ago. In those weeks, we learned that the biodiversity of Kenya is incredibly unique and essential. We felt so lucky to experience briefly what so many Kenyans experience every day. Given the beauty of the landscape, it was surprising to us that many Kenyans had never been to a national park, despite having grown up next to them. Many of the people we spoke to didn't have the same impression of the wildlife and landscapes we were beginning to learn about and fawn over. Some people offered stories about their fears of elephants, given the way they had trampled their farms and harmed their communities. Anger towards large predators such as lions and leopards wasn't uncommon either, given the fact that in many areas, livestock shared the land with the wildlife. Climate change has even begun to force animals and people into competition with each other for resources such as water and grazing. All of these negative interactions have begun to have a cumulative negative effect on the relationship between wildlife and people. And Kenya's biodiversity is suffering as a result. Kenya has faced a dramatic 60% decline in wildlife over the last 40 years. We know that we can only just begin to understand the complexity of the relationship between Kenya's people, livestock, and wildlife, all while facing the challenge of climate change. Still, we wanted to offer our unique solution to increase positive attitudes towards Kenyan, Kenya's wildlife, and it all starts with ecotourism. Something important to know is that ecotourism makes up 10% of Kenya's GDP but we can't always rely on ecotourism from international travel, travelers. With COVID wreaking havoc on our world, we know now more than ever that strengthening local ecotourism is key to securing the long life of our vast wildlife. Not only do we need to protect our wildlife from horrific crimes, but for their sake, but we must protect our economy, environment, and world. We know that only 10% of Kenyans visited a national park or reserve in 2015. 
In Africa, the median age of the population is 19 years old. Kenya has approximately 23 million people under the age of 20, which is almost half of its population. This huge proportion of young people means that they are the country's future, so engaging them in conservation is critical. So how do we increase those numbers? How can we engage the youth? With park admission fees standing between 300 and 1,000 Kenyan shillings for citizens, and 72% of Kenyan households making less than $250 every month, parks can sometimes be inaccessible or an undesirable use of resources. And that's why we present to you the Become a Wildlife Warrior program. Imagine the next generation of conservationists. Upon entry to one of Kenya's many national parks or conservancies, your child would receive a free activity book with an optional download of an associated app. These would have fun activities associated with the park. So think maps tailored to the individual ecosystems of each park, scavenger hunts for all types of animals, and fun facts that you can ask a ranger to learn about. Upon finishing the activity book in person or on the app, your child would receive a special patch designating them a wildlife warrior for that park. With each patch comes one free admission for the next park visit. Every year, we'll be updating the activity books and making sure to keep the new and fun material for those new to the program and those who are more advanced. We envision this engaging the youth of the country while still being fun for the adults in the family. By partnering with national parks, conservancies, tour companies, and even schools, we will be able to scale our program to be accessible to the entire country. We want to see millions more families visiting the park and becoming passionate conservationists. What makes us special? Well, we're partnered with Wildlife Direct. Paula and her team at Wildlife Direct are already experts at telling stories in fun and inventive ways. Their TV show, Wildlife Warriors, runs on East Africa's most watched channel, Citizen TV and their education and outreach programs for kids extends to 33 schools across the country. We have an audience and a fan base. With their influence, we can make the parks and conservancies the most popular destinations for leisure and learning. So imagine it's 2025 and the front page of Daily Nation says, wildlife ranger Wilson is a new role model creating a generation of young conservationists. There's nothing like this in Kenya yet, but we want to help you make Kenya the world's capital of biodiversity, and we can't do that without our youth. So join us and become a wildlife warrior today. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so if there are any questions, I'm going to invite those um, Participants who are watching to put your hand up and I can call on you and from the rest of the class and Matt uh, Ask your questions. You have four minutes Any questions from the rest of the class? Okay, I'll ask a question um, by the first say thank you guys so much. That's such a great presentation and I hope that we can do this. How would you pay for it? Veronica, do you want to take, take this one? one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you say, can I take this one or do you say, do you want to take this one? No, you, you. Okay, yes, I can, I can do that. <laughs> Um, okay, so in order to pay for this, we're looking at a few different things. Um, we're looking at private grants, first of all. Um, we're also looking at um, a percentage of proceeds from the app going to our program each year. Um, so if you buy a ticket to any specific park on the app, um, a percentage of that would go to us. We're also looking at having a program similar to uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts of America, um, where specific paraphernalia designates you as a wildlife warrior, whether that's a bandana or a patch or a t-shirt, as you sort of go up in the tier of, of the level of wildlife warrior that you are, um, you have the opportunity to buy other sort of clothes or objects that recognize you as a wildlife warrior. Great. 
Uh, Anyone else? Question, I can so see a question. Sorry, uh, sorry? Oh, Matt, carry on. Oh, I, yeah, I had a quick question as well. Um, so I thought that was great. I just wanted to ask whether you think there would be scope for this program to tie in with the education system or also kind of provide pathways as children move through the program and get yeah. over, similar to, I guess, the, the Girl and Boy Scouts programs? Yeah, we definitely think that there is potential for partnering within the educational system. Um, our idea has definitely grown and shifted over the last few weeks of this course. And I think that was where we started. But um, with this idea, the first, like the pilot program would probably take place at Nairobi National Park. And we could figure out the logistics of how many people are actually engaging with the activities, hearing about it, things like that and then potentially move into partnering more with the wildlife warrior clubs that are already at schools and um, the visits to conservancies through school um, to sort of strengthen this. But we also think that this model is really useful for engaging parents and kids. Even though it's really important to make kids conservationists, this can also bring the parents into the excitement who will have to pay their admissions fee, even if the kid has their free entrance to the park. So it kind of helps the parks and the program simultaneously. Okay, I have two questions from the audience. Uh, the first one's from Shamini Jayanathan. She is a, uh, a lawyer, a prosecutor actually based in London, uh, based in Kenya actually, but she's in the UK right now. Her question is, what's the primary age group targeted here? The workbook looks like it's aimed at primary school, in which case would the free admission extend to their parents? Uh, so the primary age group targeted is specifically children in primary and secondary school, yes. Um, the free admission, the way we envision it um, right now, is that when you finish your workbook or the app for the specific park, um, you get a patch and you also get one free admission for the next visit, whether that's for a parent or student. Um, Yes, <laughs> does that answer the question? Great. Okay, second question is from Pat Awari. Uh, she is an icon in conservation in Kenya. And she asks, Veronica, can your analysis look at reconnecting the youth with the ancestral way that communities cared for wildlife? Um, is that asking like if there was research that we already did on that or like could that be a path that we look into? Could it be a path? I think it definitely could be a path. We actually spoke with someone who does similar programming for youth at Gorongosa National Park, and um, they talked a lot about how incorporating programs that connected people to how nature connects with like their history and culture is um, a really important. In in okay, so the next question, it came from two people, similar question. This is the last question. Um, from Boke Werema, I, I don't think I know this person, but Dan Rubenstein asked a similar question. How would you reach local and indigenous community children who are already struggling to split time between home and chores? And, and also how would you get them to the parks? Yeah, so I think something that's really important to us is making this program accessible to people all over Kenya, not just people in urban centers. Um, something we're looking at doing is, is using grant funding or funding um, you know, taken in other ways through the program to um, pay for transportation so that we can get um, tour buses to bring students from all over the country. We're also looking at sort of a similar program to the one that Wildlife Warriors does right now, where maybe there are specific sort of field trips that are taken or, you know, three day um, trips that we do for the kids. Um, but we, we really want to make sure this program is absolutely accessible to everybody. So. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question. Sorry, Matt, and Matt, you gotta hold us to time, but I just think there's one more really interesting question that I think you should answer is by, from Ken Esau. What's the difference between this program and the wildlife clubs of Kenya? This program, the wildlife clubs right now, from my understanding through Wildlife Direct are based at the school. So this program is based at the national park. Um, so it's kind of approaching the problem from two different sides in an attempt to um, reach everybody. So if one program can expand through educational material and um, 
going to new schools, then this program can expand on the park level for the families and also just to get people ex or kids excited about it if they get to know these different animal characters and Wilson the wildlife ranger, then maybe it can create um, more excitement around this stuff and they'll learn interesting facts about wildlife that they might not other be otherwise be getting in education. And the education system seems like it's uh, a little bit slow moving to change the curriculum. So this is another way that we can do that. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. There are other questions which I will send to you and you can write your answers, but well done. Congratulations. <laughs> Wonderful presentation. Okay, so the second group that came up with a brilliant idea of how to make Kenya a world superpower in biodiversity conservation is Osset and Luca. Please wave so we can see you guys. Hi everyone. Um, if my presentation will load. Okay, there we go. So I'm Luca, uh, my partner is Osset, uh, and we were wondering um, just imagining into the future in 10 years, um, what would a fantastic headline be that could show that Kenya has become a wild, a leader in biodiversity conservation? So our headline is Kenya achieves 30 by 30. With 30% 30 of its land designated as a protected area, Kenya now leads the world's efforts in conservation and biodiversity maintenance. Now, working backwards from that, how could we actually make it happen? Um, so we started with the example of Lake Nakuru National Park, which is this beautiful park, has a gorgeous lake in the middle of it. Uh, it's famous for flamingos, rhinos, zebra, wildebeest, um, but the animals there are facing a problem. Over the past few years, the lake has been growing while the boundary of the park itself has stayed the same. So the animals are having less and less access to land, uh, to food, things like that. So. We were wondering, well, you know, maybe the park border could expand, but that kind of isn't really an option because of all of this development around it. Um, but then we saw, well, Lake Nakuru National Park borders Soisambu Conservancy. So maybe the fences between them could be taken down. That would allow the animals in each access to both of the protected areas. Uh, maybe managing them in, as a whole landscape would help the animals better. Then we realized though that Soisambu is actually already part of a collection of 33 different conservancies um, and national parks uh, called the Nakuru Wildlife Conservancy. And they manage the whole landscape uh, together collectively so that the animals can roam across a whole landscape as opposed to be confined into their small uh, protected areas. So the way that this works, because it includes uh, national parks as well as private protected areas, is through a public-private partnership, which is an agreement between a government entity and a private entity uh, to provide some sort of common goods. So this can be energy or fuel, like electricity. Um, it can be waste management, maybe infrastructure, uh, but it can also be conservation. And one of the really cool things about it is that if the government is struggling to find funding, uh, uh, hmm? Okay. okay. Um, I'm having I'm feedback. Having feedback. This is weird. Um, so the public-private partnership is great because it allows, uh, if, the, if the government is struggling to find funding or if it lacks expertise or, you know, it's just doing all sorts of other government stuff, um, then the private entity uh, can provide that. And so they can build off of each other's strengths and weaknesses. There are multiple stakeholders and the program in general can benefit. Uh, some great examples are the Peace Parks Foundation, which works uh, with governments uh, to manage parks that are across different national borders. Um, the Nature Conservancy is another great example. Gorongosa National Park, um, one national park in Mozambique that's partnered with a private organization. Um, and Nakuru Wildlife Conservancy, of course, as uh, we mentioned. So then we realized, well, it would be great if uh, Lake Nakuru National Park could join the Nakuru Wildlife Conservancy, but what if we could actually facilitate public-private partnerships for all protected areas in Kenya? Maybe that could help Kenya reach the goal of 30 by 30. Uh, 
set. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> but in our plan to use public-private partnerships to achieve 30 by 30 for Kenya, we have to ask, why do we want to achieve 30 by 30, protecting 30% 30 of the land in Kenya by 2030? We plan to use, do this because increasing public-private partnerships and increasing the amount of protected areas in Kenya will increase the reward of wildlife in the long term. Kenya has a large ecotourism sector that is a large part of its um, economic growth and protecting the biodiversity has a current investment for the economic future of Kenya. So to achieve our project goals, we want to connect the Kenyan Wildlife Service, being the national group, which will function as a public entity in our public-private partnerships and will provide collaboration of national parks, um, PPAs, which are private protected areas, including conservancies and some ranches. And we believe that landowners with large amounts of land will be integral because landowners um, can participate in this that don't have if they don't have land use practices that are in direct conflict of interest with wildlife. And 70% of the land in Kenya is owned by farms. So that's a key part of increasing the um, amount of land in Kenya that's protected, as well as community forest associations and beach management units to integrate forest and um, marine ecosystems. So what do we mean? We want to integrate all of these separate parties into partnerships based on the models of community conservation partnerships seen in the Nakuru Wildlife Conservancy, as well as the KWCA or Kenyan Wildlife Conservancy Association. The Kenyan Wildlife Conservancy Association um, helped protect a key um, ecosystem outside of the Masamura Park. They brought private landowners in the Maasai communities together to project and integrate a corridor to help migration of animals to Nara Park land adjacent to the Masamura. The KWCA worked with the Maasai community to get these private landowners to lease their land for conservation of the ecosystem. Kenya hosts some of the highest rates of biodiversity in the world. And it is one of the last places on earth where you can see the big five. And we believe that since Kenya has every type of ecosystem, we need to work to make sure that it is a biodiversity leader in the world. Using these public-private partnerships to increase protected lands and make more effective land use, as well as combining multiple state owners with multiple and differing expertise to redefine and improve the protected land management in Kenya will be the way that we can achieve 30 by 30. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you guys. That was wonderful. I am going to open the floor to questions from the class and from the other participants who have joined us. We currently have uh, 50 participants in total. Thank you guys so much. A lot of people. <laughs> Any questions from other classmates? Or Matt? Um, I'm curious about like what the what is like causing private and government owned lands to not already combine? Like what are the barriers to making this happen and how um, does your concept overcome them? Um, well, so one barrier is that sometimes uh, when private entities are, are offering to partner with national parks, it can be seen as a privatization of public lands, uh, which is a problem, um, but that's not actually what's happening. Um, so there's, there's a lot of like public or um, yeah, public resistance to uh, a perceived threat. Um, there are also issues uh, historically with Lake Nakuru where um, I think Lake Nakuru National Park has too many zebra and Soisambo has had too many buffalo or wildebeest um, that might be reversed. Um, and so it was sort of feared that by joining the lands, uh, both of the already stressed ecosystems would struggle with even more wildlife. Um, and then also just different goals. Um, governments aren't, conservation isn't usually the, the very top priority. And so if a private organization comes and says, we wanna do all this amazing stuff and we have all these really huge goals and the government's like, we just, that's sort of impossible at the moment um, considering all the other things that we have to work on. And so ours is by using all of the different um, examples
examples and models of, of what is already working. Uh, we're just trying to boost it um, to make it happen more. Great, thank you for that. I'm going to read a question um, from, let me see if I can, I can get, if you don't mind, I'm going to let them speak verbally, right? Are you guys okay with that? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, Noor Santosian. Noor, can you hear us? Sounds like an airplane. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take that off because the, the sound is not good. I'll read you his question. Issues of land have been an issue in the conservation... Oh gosh, what's happened? Sorry, one second. Issues of land have been uh, an issue in the conservation world. How can we ensure this initiative is long-term and permanent? Nice question. Um, I believe that um, having long-term, like long-term efforts for conservation requires to have like um, private entities that are dedicated to um, conservation like as a full-time job. When you have a government that um, has to face multiple things as well, like um, social issues and um, economic growth, sometimes conservation can be put on the back burner. While if you have private entities, they can kind of focus on conservation for their full-time goal, which is another reason why I believe that these public-private partnerships can be really beneficial for conservation in the long term because you're introducing these entities that their key focus is conservation and they won't be impacted throughout government changes. And so I believe that introducing these private entities that we hope to have a more like long-term um, lifespan that won't be affected by like political um, elections, then we can address these in a more like continuous manner. Yeah, also like engaging um, landowners who like this is their land um, and, in, and engaging them in conservation can ensure that it's not just some outside organization that might leave immediately, but like the private entity is a family farm or something like that, um, that has stakes in the area. Okay, I have uh, another couple of questions which are related. One from Dino Martins, who I think you all met, and uh, another one from Sh uh, Shamini, similar related question, which is, given the pressure on land for higher value use, like agriculture or mining, um, and especially given that the government has already defined what are its critical uh, development agenda in Vision 2030, it talks about food, security, affordable housing, manufacturing, healthcare. Environment isn't there. How are you going to finance and sustain this in the long term? Well, I think that's part of the uh, beauty of a public-private partnership is that um, a lot of the finances can come from these private organizations. Um, and it's not just on you know, taxpayer money or an already stretched government um, to fund this sort of thing. But another huge aspect is um, the, the increase potentially in, in ecotourism. Uh, there are a lot of national parks that are kind of isolated. Tourists don't really go to them, but if they're connected to other uh, conservancies or protected areas, then maybe they might see more um, tourism. And then also if Kenya is able to, if, if all of the protected areas are marketed as one experience of going to Kenya and seeing all this incredible biodiversity, all the wildlife, um, then a lot can be saved in marketing. So each protected area doesn't have to market itself uh, so much as Kenya markets the entire country as a biodiversity hotspot and a uh, destination for ecotourism. Great, so savings and more, more revenues. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, Luca and Osset. Really appreciate your presentation, well done. There are more questions. I see you, Tobias. I see you, um, uh, to, uh, Tobias and Kiyama. Um, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to get to those questions right now. And I just want to remind all the people who are watching, we have three more presentations to go. And then we're going to take a short break and we'll come back and we have a talk by Max Gomera from UNEP on uh, conservation and coronavirus and zoonoses. So that's something to look forward to. Um, I'm going to move to the next presentation, 
which is by Maria and Zoe. Uh, Oh, Zoe, you're doing it? Yeah, okay. So, yes. Okay, did you want to give the intro? Oh, yeah. So, my name is Maria, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm from Russia, but I currently live in New York City, and it's really cold here. So, I'm wrapping all my warm clothes that I got around me. And my partner is Zoe, and she's in California yeah. right I'm, now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm Zoe. I'm from California. I go to Princeton University studying ecology and evolutionary biology. Okay, so uh, what are the problems that our project is trying to address? One of the first major problems that we're wanting to address is the competition between the need for cooking fuel and forests. And so charcoal is needed for cooking, but for us, so the cost of this, um, of like having to create charcoal. And 55% of Kenyans report using firewood for cooking, while 11.6% report using charcoal. And firewood here isn't so much the issue because it's usually scavenged off of the forest floor. However, charcoal, um, you need to fell mature trees in order to burn down charcoal. And so this causes a lot of problems with land degradation, uh, deforestation and it also has a lot of impacts on wildlife because of habitat loss and disruption to pastoral livelihoods. Um, processing charcoal also releases a lot of toxic gases such as carbon monoxide um, which has a lot of health risks for the people who use it. Uh, the second problem that we're hoping to address is creating a more financially viable conservation. Um, oftentimes when it comes to investing in conservation projects investors are um, reluctant because it takes a really long time to realize and capitalize on the benefits of a, a conservation project and it takes a lot of patience in order to see this through um, as well as some projects are derived on law compelling but um, sometimes like unsupported concepts that can leave investors very speculative and in a place where they're investing in a very high risk situation with low rewards. The third problem that we're hoping to address is energy accessibility currently 30 or sorry, 63% of Kenyans um, don't have access to electricity, while that leaves 37% not having any on the grid or off grid access. And this is usually a very big problem for rural Kenyans who don't have access at all. So how are these problems all connected? Um, they might seem like very like unique issues. How, how can we connect these problems into a common solution? Um, the the way that we see this is through like this diagram of competition, accessibility, and viability all crossing over. And so, for example, like charcoal needed for from the forest for cooking and low accessibility of energy, um, we hope can be achieved through the common goal of finding alternative fuels. Um, for a more financially viable conservation, as well as low accessibility of energy in rural areas, we have the goal of providing affordable alternative energy options. And for a more financially viable conservation and um, competition between forest and fuels, we hope to provide a scheme for a more economical conservation that can also meet people's daily needs. And when we put these together, um, we want to create a scheme for self-sustained community conservation through green energy. Maria. So, uh, yeah. So today existing alternatives uh, include a few things. And uh, for example, uh, alternative for wildlife conservation, such as national park conservancies and marine parks, uh, but they are not really economically viable. Uh, they do contribute 10% to Kenya's GDP, but employ only uh, 300,000 people, which is less than 1% of Kenyan population, which is uh, more than 51 million people. And uh, only 8% of Kenyan territory is protected for conservation through national parks, which are managed by the KWS, and national reserves that, that are managed um, by county governments. And uh, protected areas include landscapes and seascapes. And around 160 conservancies protect around 11% of Kenyan's land. Also, in many rural um, areas in Kenya, Firewood is, uh, firewood is used for cooking, and it endangers not only the forest's existence, but also the health and the life of uh, women uh, who often have to walk very long distances and carry very heavy loads of uh, firewood. 
uh, risking being attacked by wild animals such as um, elephant or snake or, or a lion and uh, or even arrested by authorities by cutting down trees or branches mm -hmm. and uh, moreover the amount of firewood collected often does not last for more than two days so they have to go back to the forest again mm -hmm. there are also existing solar power mini grids but the scale is such that it's difficult for a company uh, for a solar power company to make a reasonable profit uh, there are also individual solar panels that can be installed directly on the roof of a house. Uh, but um, mm, let's say like there are uh, low quality and they are non long lasting. There are also better quality solar panels, but they are usually more expensive and not everyone can afford them. Yeah. Next slide, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, we came up with some solutions actually after talking with multiple experts we understood that in every situation there is a unique solution so but kind of like to make a um let's say uh, it, uh just um to 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 make some um like from a two uh boundaries so what we came up with, our one main solution includes social enterprise companies like green, en green energy companies making a goodwill deal with the community that includes land conservation around the community by the community itself. And uh, so green energy companies will lease the land from the community or they will buy the land. They, pay, they will pay monthly reduced or subsidized rent uh, and subsidies will come from the government uh, in the case of leasing the land and uh, provide electricity to the consumers who will pay a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. uh, so like I said, in different situations, either solar or biogas energy or even both can be produced and used. For example, in the villages with less than 100 individuals, individual solar panels could be installed on each house. And in the villages with more than 100 individuals, already smaller solar mini grids could be installed. And uh, one of um, additional benefits, let's say, those mini grids and solar panels could be managed by the villagers themselves. Uh, and that will provide jobs to the communities. Uh, they could be put through the training and the training could be as little as two, three weeks or as long as six months and that will be done by the company expense and then those people will be hired by the same company so and those technicians later could pay their student loan uh, that they own to the company uh, it could be with either no or small interest rate uh, from the salary obtained from the employment and uh, biogas production could be set up in a way that covers communal kitchens in villages or small towns and will provide biogas for cooking. And then women don't need to go to collect firewood anymore. So yeah, in the case of um, biogas, companies could also uh, collect waste or invasive species or livestock dung that uh, is not used to, let's say, um, fertilize land or some other uses, composting for the communities themselves. And uh, they could also collect trash from public lands on a regular basis to feed the biogas plant and uh, sell biogas uh, produced to those communities. So basically, um, this is the status quo, as we explained, is going on right now. People are having to chop down forests to create charcoal, but as a result, women are having to spend more time and energy looking for firewood that's uh, of less quality than what they were getting before as the forest line recedes farther and farther back um, due to like charcoal industry. And as Maria explained, this also increases women's likelihood of having dangerous wildlife encounters. And so the, how our solution is different from the status quo is that we're looking to provide two solutions. One is a, a electricity solution in the form of solar and the other is a, a cooking fuel solution in the form of biogas. So in the solar scheme, um, we have home installations and mini grids and home installations would just be for like individual homesteads, while mini grids would be able to serve communities of 100 or more individuals. 
And in the mini grid line, um, the United Nations has a framework convention on climate change. And one of the guidelines for it is that companies developing on land need to leave a 30% uh, buffer that is undeveloped on that land. And we're hoping to incentivize communities to leave that land undeveloped by partnering with carbon credit firms. And this um, carbon credit that they can sell to like airline companies, for example, could be another form of income for them. Um, in the biofuel scheme, we have the biofuel units not only providing gas for cooking, but they also provide organic fertilizer. And in both of the solar and uh, biogas schemes, we have training and hiring of local technicians, which could, which could be a source of uh, local employment for people. And um, on the conservation side, uh, relieving pressure from forests um, due to charcoal could help to revitalize landscape and also bring the wildlife back onto these communities and lead to um, like uh -huh. wildlife conservation um, in these areas. And it also provides a, a opportunity for wildlife monitoring. Um, so we learned by talking to experts that what people will sometimes do is that poachers um, who are going into forests leaving snares will go in and if they're like seen by somebody and they ask like, oh, what are you doing? It's like, oh, I was just like gathering wood or get like gathering wood for charcoal or something like that. So they'll use it as a pretense um, in order to like poach. But with this, because people don't need to um, use wood from the forest anymore, they could be more wary of people who are going um, in and out of their land suspiciously. And so our cost structure um, to get the project off the ground, we were mainly going to rely on grants, microfinancing, and revolving funds. And revolving funds is a scheme that has been used by the Northern Rangeland Trust um, in their biogas program. And basically what it is is that um, people living in these conservancies, they'll pay their conservancies um, around like $11 uh, USD. And this is a little over the cost of a bag of charcoal, but what this money uh, goes into is a revolving fund, which basically means that the money they're paying for these units gets reinvested into the program so that the conservancy can buy more units. And this is a way for them to be financially self-sustainable through the program. Um, also on the biodigester side, the units usually cost around like 300 to 750 to 900 USD. It really depends on the capacity of the digester, whether it's for a kitchenette that can serve multiple people or for a single family home. Um, but they also gain the benefits of fertilizer and cooking gas, as well as um, local employment from, from maintenance. Um, and on the electricity side, the Households for the individual um, solar panels would have to pay for like the installation and the infrastructure. Um, but for the solar grids, when they're when the companies are buying and leasing land, they would pay the landowners um, and the landowners would pay for electricity. And also in this scheme, there's the extra income coming from the carbon credit of however much land they're willing to leave aside um, to to sell as carbon credits. And um, training of technicians would have to be paid for by the solar and biogas companies, but this is uh, gives another advantage of low travel costs of workers because um, maintenance workers would be serving the communities that they already live in. They don't have to travel around and this relieves um, some of the pressure from companies needing to like outsource work. Okay, so how we will measure the success of the program? Well, it basically will be measured by how much energy is provided to the communities. The electricity should be enough voltage provided to sustain basic necessities. And uh, some people will want more, some people will want less. Uh, so in cooking biofuel should be enough quantity to sustain a medium sized household, which cooks like approximately, let's say three meals per day. So also the monetary compensation uh, for the power provided should be enough for the energy company to successfully run and uh, maintain its business. Also in the same way, monetary compensation for the land lease or bought should be appropriate in each region. Um, again, it could also be subsidized by the government and salaries of hired local technicians should reflect the region-wise accepted salary for the for, for this position. Also, communities should conduct their own surveys of wildlife in area uh, surrounding their um, village or small town and infrastructure and uh, keep all the records and such surveys could uh, be done on a weekly or monthly basis. Also, uh, including surveys of vegetation, such as, you know, cut down wood, trees, or grass, 
how, how, how tall it is and uh, how it is used. Uh, so, and also we were thinking that there should be regular audits conducted by KWS or any other governmental agency uh, that should basically just make sure that all parties stick to the goodwill agreement and project guidelines. And um, it could be again adapted to each case but in general, in the case of repeated inconsistencies between agreement and the real life applications, government agencies could uh, recall tax credits and subsidies from the electrical companies. Uh, and also they could uh, remove their permission to collect trash for biofuel and public lands. So our early adopters are hoping to be um, village and small town residents rural communities, um, specifically communities who live around conservancies, uh, sort of following like the early model of the Northern Rangeland Trust. Um, also investors um, who would want to uh, invest early on into the project to help get it off the ground, um, as well as landowners being like private landowners, um, communities and government landowners. So yeah, Kenya government. And this also leads into our main customer segments that we're hoping for. So Kenya government would benefit from this um, because two things, it helps to uh, provide Kenyans more electricity, which has been one of their main goals. And then also to bring Kenya more into the green energy industry to provide cleaner energy for Kenya. Um, we also hope to service rural communities who don't have access to clean fuels or electric power, um, as well as schools. And this has the benefit of helping kids have like hot meals during school, as well as having better electricity to study for, to study with at home and uh, during school time. And that's it. Wow, that was a lot of work. Yes, well done. Uh, well done, both of you. Really incredible detailed um, project plan there. I, you did go quite over your time, and we didn't stop you. Um, we, were, we were deep in, in your story, which was amazing. So thank you for that. I'm going to open the floor now, but I think we're only going to take two questions because of the time. Um, any questions from the other students? And you can unshare your screen now, guys. Okay. Any so questions for you? about the carbon credits um, and how that mm -hmm. plays into things is, is really interesting. I was wondering if is there a precedent for that elsewhere in the world that you know of? But, um, yeah, we um, were actually talking with Dixon and he said that um, they can apply that for their program to be under the REDD carbon credit scheme. And so um, they can like turn in an application and we could help them connect with like carbon credit firms. That was one of our ideas was getting them that needed help in order to organize that with them. So that's one of the things that grants would be going towards is like facilitating that connection. Fantastic. I really hope that this project does get picked up and supported. Any other question from the participants or you know, um, students? Maybe I'll ask a quick question. You, you seem to have quite a lot of detail actually about how the energy sector works and, and what's possible. How did you get all this information in such a short time? Because you literally only had like a week to do this. Yeah, we talked with um, Dom, Andrew and Dixon. They were all like incredibly helpful and insightful um, with their knowledge. We honestly like we couldn't have done it without them. They were, they were awesome. If you guys are here, like, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. They are, they are all here. They're all watching. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they gave us so many resources and we read so much. We barely slept in the last three days. So, yeah, <laughs> but we, because we really wanted to get this project realistic and going and we got so many different um, like approaches and we tried to find some kind of middle ground that could be adapted for a different case scenario. Well, well, I love it, and I think we should definitely pitch this idea to some of the conservancies and maybe the Northern Rangers Trust or the, you know, one of the groups of conservancies, maybe the groups that Luca has been working on with OSET down in Nakuru or down in the Mara, you never know, maybe there is potential for this. I think it's a great, great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Feel free to you. <laughs> <laughs> we will, we will. Um, and just a reminder to those people who, uh, some more people have come online since, since uh, the last presentation, just to remind you that we now have just two more presentations left in this uh, amazing uh, set of presentations by students from Princeton University and Columbia as part of an undergraduate course 
uh, that I've been teaching. It's only a three week course. We've done, this is the end of the second week. And the next students who will be presenting on how Kenya can become a world superpower for biodiversity conservation is Sophia and Kendra. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, okay. Ole Rapanke is the owner of 200 cows, um, 50 goats, and 20 sheep. He lives in northern Lefkipia County and has paid for more than 16 fines for illegal grazing in 2017 alone, both um, in court and out of in an interview with reporters, he said that attempts to seek justice um, led only to frustration. So Ole is really one example of a much larger problem um, when we talk about inefficiencies in the judicial system. One thing is the unwillingness of a lot of Kenyans to actually use the court system in the first place. Uh, we understand that many conservancies and a lot of the pastoralist communities living around them are solving these petty crime matters essentially off the books uh, because they don't want to uh, incur the cost uh, nor the time that are typically associated with the trial. And people like Ole are also, they just lack basic trust in the judiciary. And another thing is that this example shows us um, are that there are just really some blatant inefficiencies in the judicial system itself. One analysis by Wildlife Direct of 957 court records found that around 45%, so like half of the offenses charged, um, were still pending in the courts all throughout the year 2018. And this is due to a couple of reasons. One, within these specific courts, like the NET and subordinate courts, um, prosecutors are really severely overworked. There are also huge delays in the procurement of witnesses and of evidence. And then there are also huge backlogs. Uh, so what can we do to tackle these um, problems? The current criminal justice system doesn't really involve the local communities. So we want to address traditional courts. Um, traditional courts typically adjudicate on land and marital matters. And shown here is a picture of a rabbi traditional court in coastal Kenya. So we therefore we want to find some way to expand the traditional court's capacity to handle wildlife matters. Initially, we we're also thinking about poaching and possession crimes, since those are the ones we commonly hear on the news. However, petty crimes and the penalties they attract means that the burden of proof is high. So um, a traditional court may not be best suited to adjudicate on these matters. So what should we do next? So our proposal is to essentially expand the capacity of traditional courts. Uh, one thing to mention is that the uh, jurisdiction of these traditional courts comes from their uh, court records, which are actually processed into subordinate authorized courts. And these traditional courts, they're also part of um, alternative dispute resolutions, which are under Article 159 of the Kenyan Constitution. But they themselves, as um, arbitrators of customary law, don't have individual jurisdiction. So we wanted to expand their capacity by essentially collaborating with legal aid clinics to one, develop strategies on how to handle specifically entry activity crimes in protected areas. This is um, really a very pressing matter because uh, the most common offense that we see, like 52% of offenses charged under the Wildlife Act aren't the poaching and the possession cases that Sophie and I were initially interested in because that's what we had seen on the news but rather they involve things like illegal entry, um, illegal entry with wildlife into protected areas. And then two, the function of this collaboration between the legal aid clinic and the traditional courts is to build the capacity of these courts, especially in pastoralist Kenya, to deal with uh, cases of wildlife crime. So like training on uh, how to write court records and how to connect to these authorized subordinate courts. In this way, the legal mobile clinics are essentially drivers of awareness. 
therefore our goal is that they influence the traditional courts in order to create a new and novel precedence on addressing these wildlife crime matters. Um, our approach also means that we're bringing wildlife crime decision making to the local level. So we're keeping attention to these behaviors locally, which uh, also means that we get to expedite the judicial process because things are just fixed there and then and at much lower cost than what would be incurred going through the court system through a trial. So part of our strategy, we want to promote um, community service orders. So sentences that go back towards creating awareness of particular wildlife crime offenses. This is very, very important because currently 30% of convicted offenses result in a discharge. So convicted persons are, they're set free. And especially um, these discharges are mostly preferred in the illegal entry cases that we're interested in. So through our proposal, we want these offenders, we don't want, like, they're not just sitting in jail, so it's a non-custodial sentence, but they're also not just being set free. Rather, they're contributing back to our central goal of conservation. We also want to involve um, people like the county wildlife conservation compensation committees um, in our goal of creating local awareness because the CWCs, they're already in conversation with conservancies, police, so they might be really useful in consolidating information and essentially centralizing our efforts when we tackle these crimes. And then we also want to consider organizations like the Kenya Wildlife Conservancies Association who can serve as a channel to um, access these conservancies and protected areas and then bring them into our discussion. Our main takeaways are that um, by having these mobile clinics work with the sub-authorized uh, courts and train the traditional courts to handle petty wildlife offenses, uh, we want to um, unlock the law and make it accessible for the people. So through the training of legal mobile clinics, we hope to equip local residents with some knowledge of the law and make it accessible to the layman. We also want to transfer some ownership back to the communities because the communities are the ones that make the decisions. So the traditional courts can give galvanize discussion on the values of these animals. And lastly, we want to embed values of conservation into the culture by tapping into existing social structures that practice um, customary law. Thank you to Thank everyone you. who offered their generous help. Yeah. That was great. Well done. Okay, again, I'm going to open this up to the floor students and um, visitors. I, I think uh, that was a surprising approach to making Kenya a world leader in conservation, transferring ownership and decision-making to a traditional court system. I don't think, I'm not sure if anybody's really thought about doing that. Any, any comments? I know Shamini is still on the line. Shamini, if you'd like to talk, I can, uh, I can make you live. Where is she? I'm going to let, Shamini, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so, um, yeah, I had a discussion um, with Kendra and Sophia earlier about this, about, the, about sort of road mapping it, and it is a really interesting idea. Um, I think that we just have to be very careful that certain barriers are in place to ensure that it's not abused and that serious cases within the context of the crimes that they identify as suitable are sort of sidestep the criminal justice system when they shouldn't. Um, and we had a discussion about how they might make this work by prioritizing, first of all, the counties, which have the most prevalent, um, have, have quite a high instance of these types of crimes where these traditional courts actually exist. And we talked about the roadmaps in terms of getting the buy-in from the director of public prosecutions, as well as KWS, police, and conservancy associations who might be um, relevant to these sorts of offences. So yeah, it's a very, very interesting idea. Um, and I think as long as they can house it within the DPP's policy on diversion, um, which exists, I've sent it to them, um, as well as within the existing law and the barriers that are in there, then I think it's a great idea. 
Awesome. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to uh, see there seems to be one question down here. Hold on. Uh, Lillian Balanga, I'm going to put Lillian on so that you can hear her. Lillian, just hold on one second. Why does it take so long to find people? Oh, I can't see her. Okay, I can't see Lillian. Uh, I'm sorry, I know why. She's... Okay, uh, Lillian, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Uh, can you speak again? I think. Hi, Paula. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hi everyone. Hi. So Lillian is in uh, in the north of Kenya. She works for the NRT. <laughs> Lillian, can you? Hi, everyone. We can hear Sorry, you. my network is so bad. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's hear your question. Hmm. Okay, there seems to be a problem. I'm going to, um, I will mute her and I Oh, Paul, you muted yourself. Yes, Paula. Do you hear me? Hi, Paula, can you hear me? Paul, you muted yourself. We can hear you, Lillian. You can go ahead with your question. Okay. I'm sorry about that, guys. Okay, so Lillian's question is, inclusivity is very paramount. How are you going to ensure that the gender aspect will be taken care of? As we know, pastoral communities have their own cultural, traditional ways as indigenous people. Yeah, this is definitely a very uh, sensitive and integral consideration. That's why we think it's really important that the illegal aid clinics, those mobile clinics are working in conjunction with the communities. We're thinking, hopefully we can reach out to some NGOs that do pro bono assistance and might have uh, networks in more rural pastoralist communities. And then also maybe Ken Kenyan universities who have some of their students uh, take part in these legal mobile clinics as part of their uh, training for those people to collaborate and really, really collaborate with the communities because it's very, uh, it's hard to juggle, you know, the law and also um, taking into consideration, you know, culture and customs. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions from the students, Matt, uh, or any of the other uh, participants who are watching? I was briefly wondering if uh, you see this having potential to expand to other areas of um, justice and injustice. So, um, you know, maybe addressing like colonial era wrongs um, that are still persisting, uh, or if this would already be maxed out um, with just the wildlife stuff. Uh, at this point, there are some considerations we might have to think about is that um, a lot of times the like the punishments that are dealt with in these traditional courts are not exactly commensurate with the uh, crime that was committed. So we're thinking at the local level dealing with very petty offenses. Um, so like the, I think illegal entry crime in the WCMA is six months imprisonment or 100,000 Kenyan shillings. So it's, it's like the penalty is not very high. Um, thinking about issues of like colonialism and the impact it's had, that's extremely important, but we're not sure at this stage, these traditional courts are best equipped um, to deal with those issues. I guess in terms of the petty crimes for like, we wanted to do community service orders. So like we could, the, the offenders could restore what the crimes that they have committed. So, um, so like if they had illegally grazed, they could um, go help the rangers um, plant more vegetation and help with taking out invasive species. So we want something to directly, so that the offenders could directly um, restore the crimes they actually committed. Great idea. Okay, your next question is from Noor Santosian. He's also a conservationist and I'm going to get him on the line. Oh. Noor, can you hear us? 
Yes, I can hear you. Great. Let us hear your question. Yeah, the question of uh, a court criminals and court punishment because uh, I had a dream of the same, but uh, when times was by, we understand things to do with corruptions, uh, tried to hinder the justice of the captives or the person who was accused. And that renders us, you see, we cannot deliver a good results, especially when it comes to punishing the convicted people. How can we handle this? Did you guys understand? Sophia and Kendra, I'm did so you sorry. Could you say that one? Could you say that one more time? I'm sorry. I'm saying this now. Corruption is rolling like every corner of the country, and when it comes to punishing the people, how can we ensure that this thing is not uh, does not hinder on how we are trying to execute the the punishment for the accused persons. So how do you protect, how do you prevent corruption from creeping into a traditional court and undermining the justice? Oh, we were also, we were, um, yeah, we were really worried about this. We also know that corruption is already a lot, like a, a, a very large problem right now with the judiciary. Um, we, for one, hope that the um, the system of like multiple agencies sort of being responsible for each other will serve as a, a sort of checks and balances system. And we're also going to very carefully limit what uh, offenses can actually be tried at the level of the tr traditional court. Um, so like what's being said in the chat, <laughs> um, the traditional courts, they're, they are not lawyers. They have no part in depriving anyone of their liberty. So we're going to stick to like illegal grazing <laughs> times for now. It was very broad, but, um, uh, 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 more and more. oh, sorry, feedback. Uh, she's just focusing on, oh, sorry. I have, um, thank you, Noor, really appreciate it. I'm going to go now to Pat Awori. Pat, I'm going to put you on speaker. Can you hear us? Pat Awori is a well-known Kenyan conservationist. So Pat, do you want to, uh, can, you, can you speak? Pat, are you there? Uh, hold on, I don't know why I can't unmute her. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, I think this is a brilliant idea. Um, I like very much the idea of both types of um, potential uh, justice, the reintroduction of traditional courts and mobile legal courts, uh, not only for uh, wildlife conservation, but a, a whole cross-section of um, uh, legal issues. As you are aware from your work, I'm sure, most Kenyans do not have access to anything like this. So already it would be huge advancement. My question is, what thoughts did you have about how to finance, especially like a legal, a legal mobile clinic? So that's where we were hoping that uh, maybe through a combination of NGOs who perhaps can offer pro bono assistance and uh, the collaboration with Kenyan universities who might be able to have some of their students participate in the legal clinics as part of their student training um, that will cover the the uh, costs associated with running and staffing the mobile clinics. Um, in terms of other revenue streams, we were also thinking about using um, like penalties that have already been garnered through the traditional courts, like maybe livestock to yeah. further go back to the system and, and finance. Yeah, okay. So that they, they basically the if they are found guilty they pay for the costs. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Very, very um innovative ideas coming up here. Thank you guys so much. I am going to move on to the last presentation and just remind everybody that uh, after this presentation, the last presentation, we will have another um, half an hour or so of uh, 
Q and A, or maybe ten minutes or fifteen minutes of Q and A. So that after, and then we will have a short break before we get to the presentation by Max Gomera and a colleague of his from the United Nations who will be talking to us about coronavirus and zoonoses, so the transmission of diseases from our wildlife um, that are causing the current ongoing pandemic. So the last presentation, last but not least, is by Madison and Emma. Yay, okay. Um, give me one second to share my screen and set everything up. That's fun, isn't it? Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so this is a, can you guys hear me? Yes? Maybe? Yes. yes. Awesome. Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, so yeah, this is iPad present. So if there are notifications, I'm going to shoot them away right away. This is um, uh, our project. My name is Emma Gomez. Um, and I'm a junior at Columbia College uh, in New York City right now. Awesome. Um, so here's our presentation. This is a photo of uh, all of us when we were getting some presentations um, uh, back at Impala. Um, what we kind of wanted to open our presentation on was about the projects that we were doing when we were at Impala. Um, so basically when we got there, um, as many of the Princeton students know, we had to sacrifice um, a half of our luggage to bring resources into the brand new genetics lab. And by the end of our th first three week course, having all of us, having it be all of our first times in Kenya, and for some of us, our first time doing scientific research, um, uh, we were, you know, put into this amazing lab. Um, we were doing lab work um, uh, at Impala. We were being, uh, and then we were presenting our findings um, to people, uh, to scientists in Kenya. And I think that a question that was on our minds, uh, on a lot of our minds was, why are we doing this? <laughs> For a lot of us, we were like brand new to science or brand new to genetics or in brand new to the country. And we were absolutely shocked at how many people showed up. And even today, right now, we're like completely floored at the people who want to hear from us. And we were thinking like just how amazing it was that we could all share these resources. But at the same time, a question that was on our minds was like, the like it is so like we can't believe that we have the opportunity to work at such a fantastic lab in Kenya, you know, and over time we realized that that Impala was one of the only places that research like this could actually occur. And so scientists and people who could benefit from wildlife and conservation research um, were like barely um, uh, able to access the resources that they need needed to actually accomplish the research that was so necessary and so impactful. So we were completely touched that, um, like when I did the bongo presentation, that people from the animal orphanage um, of Kenya came in and said, wow, like, can you please show us how to analyze fecal samples so we can continue the project? Because it's really important to us that we continue researching. Me, myself, when I went to the Nanyuki uh, hospital to get diagnosed with a ringworm, the doctor said to me, oh, what are you up to in Kenya? What are you doing? And I said, I'm, uh, oh, I'm just studying. I'm doing genetics lab. I, we're doing PCR. And he said, oh my God can we use your PCR machine? <laughs> he suddenly got really animated because these, the number of operating research facilities in Kenya that have the kind of resources that an example of Impala has are very few. Um, so what we decided to make was a kind of committee group that would provide resources to the groups uh, that deserve them and that um, could work well from the research. So- um, Wait, wait hey, I'm here, I'm here. Awesome, Madison, take it away. I, I had myself on mute. I was trying to talk. Um, I'm I so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that these were lab resources that we kind of took for granted. Um, myself as a natural sciences major at Princeton, I'd been exposed to a lot of this lab stuff before. And I thought the projects that we were doing were kind of small and silly. Like, I was like, we're not real researchers, we're undergrads. Um, and then to just be taken seriously by the research community um, in Kenya and around Impala was just so cool. Um, great. So as we started kind of asking questions, both 
to our instructors and to a lot of the other people who are on Impala about Kenya's research capacities. And then now talking to Dr. Martins and a few other people this weekend. Um, and of course, Paula has been incredibly helpful. Um, we identified a few main obstacles to increasing biodiversity and conservation research in Kenya. Um, so first, the resources that are available for research facilities and education um, tend to be mostly used by researchers um, who are coming in from international universities. Um, like Paula had mentioned that many people in Kenya have never heard of Impala. And I think it's really strange because it's such a great facility. Um, we had to bring in our own lab equipment when we were taking our courses there. The labs were still being built. Um, and of course, that's very labor and time intensive and very costly if you're flying in these big, expensive, very delicate machines from the US. Um, our flights were 15 hours long. That's not something you can just do on a little weekend trip and hop over and grab a PCR machine and bring it back. Um, so it wouldn't be realistically attainable because there's nowhere that you can acquire it in Kenya, as far as I'm aware. Um, and of course, the research centers rely on foreign visitors for their income. Um, according to Dr. Martins yesterday, almost 40% of Impala's um, revenue comes from researchers coming in. Um, and as we've kind of noticed now with the COVID pandemic and the entire shutdown of international travel is that this isn't necessarily a stable source of income. And if this shutdown continues much longer, there's going to be a, a burden from that lack of funding. Um, Secondly, um, the number of research facilities that are available is kind of in flux. Um, Impala and the Tacoma Basin Institute are pretty stable, but other, uh, other centers um, kind of fade in and out as they receive funding or interest, um, but they don't have that long-term impact that Impala and TPI have managed to attain. Um, also, um, we talked to Dr. Martins and he said that a very small number of published conservation research done in Kenya is done by Kenyans. Um, there's not a lot of incentives for Kenyans to be involved in these international research projects. Um, while places like Impala might subsidize stays for Kenyan students and research assistants, um, if you can just bring in your own grad students from the U.S., that's what you're going to do probably if you're a big international lab. Um, and so a lot of students in Kenya who are doing graduate work end up going into industry rather than academia because that's where the jobs are. These are some wonderful Kenyans who are doing amazing work. <laughs> um, there's Sharon and Jackson. Um, uh, and uh, these are just examples of people who kind of uh, subvert these issues that Madison was talking about. Right, really excellent people. And we're like, why are, we, why are they not out there doing research? You know, we, we met some really great project managers and research assistants, but we wanted to know why they weren't instituting their own research and having their own labs eventually. Next slide. So what exactly are we proposing here? Um, we are proposing a uh, committee called CSAC. That is the Conservation Science Advisory Committee uh, of Kenya. So um, the plan here is that we are creating a committee that is comprised of government officials in the state departments of higher education and research and also university leaders and the leaders of prominent Kenyan research institutions. So essentially what we're doing um, uh, is we're connecting um, people who are involved in the world of research in Kenya um, and kind of pooling together the resources to make research happen for Kenyan citizens. So the goals of the group are to create more opportunities for Kenyans to do high quality natural science research in the country by um, providing support for the creation of appropriate research facilities and tools, facilitating the connections between Kenyan research universities, um, between each other and the international um, researchers, and creating opportunities for Kenyan scientists to apply and receive grants, and encouraging natural science research to take place among uh, Kenyan like professors and ind industry professionals. So those are a lot of things. Um, but in essence, it, um, uh, something that we were told by, um, you know, people we talked to like, um, uh, like Dino and like Maggie were that it's just Kenyan scientists don't necessarily see science research as a viable career option because professors are more like teaching focused as opposed to research focused in Kenya. And because it's just not it's not making money doing natural science research and conservation research is really really difficult and getting funding is really really difficult if you don't have an institution to back you and the reason that impala is so successful or tbi is so successful is because they have like 
a lot of partnerships and connections with international groups that are interested in research. Um, so one of the major um, ways that we hope to achieve our goals of getting more Kenyan researchers with the proper resources and facilities that they need is to host an annual biodiversity networking conference. Um, and so that would just be like a conference once a year where we um, uh, get Kenyan graduate students, postdocs, PhD students who um, uh, are interested in doing research and pair them with the opportunity to network with international groups that are interested in providing funding, but also um, international institutions that want to uh, create, uh, you know, research opportunities, and also with each other between universities and between research institutions that already exist in Kenya by using existing research networks. So that's one of those things. That's one of our major things. And the second major thing is mentoring. So as opposed to doing pro um, program management and research assistance, which is super important and we're obviously will continue, is um, just by uh, making sure that Kenyan students get to actually be put on like the published paper and get to be field researchers alongside whatever international groups come in to do work. Um, and that comes with everything that goes with that. Um, so yeah, we want to partner the students um, and we want to have the uh, um, biodiversity conference. So this is also this slide is also where I talk a little bit about um, the customers and the channels of how we get those things across. Um, just to name a couple groups that we think would be interested automatically. Um, and some early adopters would probably be the National Museum of Kenya, especially their Biodiversity Center, um, Impala and TBI, because those two, although they're already pretty connected, I think that they could benefit from connections with more research institutions that aren't as well known in Kenya. Um, also, we're thinking um, several uh, um, what are the university unaffiliated research programs like the International Livestock Research Institute, the Kenya Agricultural Research Institute, the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology, the World Agroforestry Center. There is a lot of demand for ecological research um, uh, that can take place in Kenya. So what we're trying to do is foster the connections between people who want the research done and the people who can do that research. Um, yeah. Awesome. So can you guys still hear me? I just put it on speaker, so I wasn't like holding the phone to my face. It sounds good. Um, okay, awesome. Um, so obviously this is going to have some costs associated with it. Hosting a large conference um, will not be an easy task or a cheap one. Um, in addition, we might need some you know, administrative salaries as we're organizing all of this. Um, so we hope that by highlighting the importance of both applied and theoretical ecological study, we can convince the Kenyan national government that natural science research is a priority. Um, and we can take some of the, the um, projects that we've done in the past or maybe not we, but the scientific community at large, or at large, um, and show them how some of this more theoretical and applied, or not applied work, um, you know, where it's in international researchers coming in to study animal behavior or things like that, have morphed into projects that have benefited um, the Kenyan biodiversity and wildlife scene. Um, and so hopefully we could, you know, pull some government funding, as well as working with NGOs and private funds, focusing on development and access to technology and capacity building, um, the Welcome Trust funds, postdoctoral and graduate work, um, you know, finding, helping connect students to those resources so that they can continue to further their education. Um, and that would be how we would bring in revenue for the program. Cool. Um, key metrics and unique value proposition. So here are some metrics that we're hoping to kind of judge our success by. Um, so as a committee, we want to fund uh, three new lab facilities within Kenyan universities that will be paired with institutions um, in the United States by 2035. So that's not only building the new lab facilities and giving people the resources they, that they need, but also making sure that there is a constant um, uh, funding support from a university outside. Um, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be outside, but like a university that has like a very vested and powerful interest in conservation research. Um, and then, uh, Pairing, uh, oh my goodness, uh, 20, yeah, pairing each major international research team affiliated with CSEC with at least one student mentee by 2025. What is this 20? I think this is supposed to be 2025. The next 40% of natural science research done in Kenya has a Kenyan first or second author. That's really important to us. Um, uh, and that's uh, in uh, the next 10 years. And then biodiversity, the biodiversity conference will have uh, 6,000 international attendees by 2023. 
Um, I actually think that that won't be that difficult because I think that there's a huge need for biodiversity research occurring in Kenya. So as long as we have the space, I think that that's something that can happen. Um, and why why are we why is this important why is this an important idea well right now the current channels of natural science research in kenya are pretty much like dependent on the foreign resources and research researchers and the benefits of that research go straight back to wherever um the you know the people are coming from to do that those studies in kenya um and so many of the benefits, you know, it, it just doesn't make it back to Kenyan students. And despite the world's enormous need for strong ecology and conservation research, there's a lack of strong research institutions um, uh, that are based within Kenya and run by Kenyans. And that's due in no small part to Kenyan science graduates seeing a more viable career path in NGOs and in the private sector, and just a lack of research mentorship in general. Um, so our committee's mission aims to clear the way for Kenyan scientists to pursue natural science research by providing them with stronger facilities that compete with international um, uh, natural science labs, um, connections to sources of funding and connections to each other that they currently lack, um, and also to connect the dots within the Kenyan academic culture between studying the natural world and actually applying those concepts to Kenya's environmental needs. Um, we connect the goals of natural science with the goals of Kenya as a whole. Um, so here's our painting the future slide. Um, this is kind of a really long term project and it's just because one, like there are lots and lots of short term goals that we can do to strengthen Kenya's research programs, but down the line, there are so many more opportunities that our committee can provide for people. One being eventually a source of grant funding and collecting enough donations so that we can provide, let's say, $50,000 in grants, $500,000 in grants per year to Kenyan researchers. Eventually, programs that we can put into primary schools to encourage younger students to pursue STEM and let them know that STEM research is a viable and essential career. Um, giving out um, scholarships to attend PhD level programs. All of these things are can become possible um, with the more support that this committee gets um, um, nationally and internationally. So we are looking to start a new future, a future in which research institutions in Kenya have strong, sec secure, cooperative facilities and tools to accomplish their work in natural science and are paired with engaged, enthusiastic members of the community that want to dedicate their lives to researching the environment of Kenya and applying it to bettering the lives of Kenyan communities and the world at large. Thank you very much, especially to Paula, Matt, Dino, and Maggie for all your advice that you've given us. And now we are going to take questions. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can get back to Zoom. That was you, fantastic. You Thank you both. That was fantastic. Well done. Well done. Thanks. I'm sorry um, that was so long. <laughs> no, I don't worry. I think that uh, you guys did a great job of navigating the challenges. You can see Dino Martins has joined us. Welcome, Dino. Thank you, Dino. Um, I asked Dino to join us because when the students take a break, I, I want the Kenyans to stay on the line and listen to Dino tell us more about Impala because as you were talking, I realized that actually a lot of people on the line have never heard of Impala and should know about this incredible international facility that we have right here on Kenyan soil. But for now, the floor is still yours. So let's have some questions. I can see that there is one in the Q&A. Um, sorry, one second. From David Gottlieb, I'm going to see if I can get him on the line. David? David, are you there? This is so weird. He seems to be on mute. Oh, okay. There we are. David, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Is it, am I unmuted? You are, you're unmuted, yes. Yes. Okay, great. Yes, my question is just, I just wanted to know if you, um, if you spoke with the African Academy of Sciences, which is right here in Kenya, um, they had do a lot of research uh, in many different areas. And some of the research they do is in biodiversity. They work with a lot of uh, postgraduate students all, or, 
all around uh, Africa. And um, there are many Kenyan scientists working on some of these issues. They also work on other issues, health. And uh, um, so I was just wondering if you spoke with them, because if you haven't, I think you should reach out to them. I think that would be a great idea of someone we should reach out to. Oh, I'm on, am I on mute? No, I'm okay. No. Um, yeah, we were unfortunately not able to talk to as many people as we would have liked to this weekend. Um, but definitely moving forward, we would like to partner with them and see how they're doing what they're doing and hopefully, yeah. you know, bounce some ideas off them. Yeah, so that's a really good idea. Something that was like very specific to our program was making it specific to Kenya and making it specific to conservation. But I think that that's a really good way mm -hmm. to like kind of just like reach out and like share ideas and maybe even borrow like some of the structure that they use to, um, and especially like channels for finding funding that we could definitely take from that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any other questions for this group? I think it's really fascinating your idea of making Kenya a research hub for biodiversity um, and conservation because we have this phenomenal, you know, natural, you know, all these amazing natural spectacles and uh, most mm -hmm. of the research is being done at international centers. So bringing it back home makes a lot of sense. I know that we have several people from government from Kenya Wildlife Service who are actually on this call and I wonder if anybody amongst them feel that or would like to ask a question. I'm, I'm seeing another question from Pat Awori. I'm gonna bring her back on. One moment. Hello. Great, while you're getting her set up, I just- well, oh, Pat, Pat is on. Sorry, go ahead, Pat. Yeah, sorry, I just wondered, I mean, in listening to, to um, how you are looking at how this group could be relevant I wondered whether it also could be like an umbrella body for all to bring together many, all the different scientists working uh, in, in uh, biodiversity conservation. I don't know that one exists and it could be a good repository for when uh, government uh, are looking to make decisions on things that they have an actual one place that they can go to. So even if, uh, it starts out not having a money to employ people, but it could be a membership driven perhaps that all mm -hmm. those who are working are so that, you know, they are known. I mean, we stumble, unfortunately, in this country on, on uh, people working on things quite by accident. Um, and if we who work in the field stumbled on them by accident, I'm not sure how government might know who is doing what and where and perhaps this might be an, a wonderful initiative that would bring all those different people uh, together so that they also can talk to each other, speaking a similar language, but from a scientific, uh, pure science background that uh, would really, I think it's very exciting what the pos possibilities that this would, would bring. And the linkages to National Museum of, Nation of, of Kenya, of course, is excellent amongst others. Thank you for that. Yeah, Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I definitely think that's an awesome idea of like having it be membership based. And then it's, it's so easy to find if you're a journalist or if you're in the government and you want to make a choice or anybody who could benefit or even if you're a citizen that's like I'm having human wildlife conflict issues. Like I think it would be so great to have like a record of members of the community. And then it would be easier also for members to find each other without necessarily like meeting in person at a conference or an event that we come up with. So I actually think that having a directory involved with that is an awesome idea. So thank you. Yeah, for sure. We had really based this idea on wanting to make um, biodiversity and conservation research in Kenya as collaborative as it could possibly be. And so I love that idea of bringing everyone together and helping them make those connections. That's really what was at the heart of this project. So thank the you. great thing about like making this project is like I was very enthusiastic about it because it's like it is so obvious that Kenya is the perfect place to be doing biodiversity research and to be doing conservation research. Like it's it's just great. So there's no reason that people wouldn't want to do it here. So the things that we're overcoming are just like they feel they don't they feel like barriers that 
will give way if we think intelligently about it as opposed to like if Kenya was just like a tundra like how could we make it a biodiverse place like it's it's this is a great place to do research so I'm very optimistic about it right and there are so many people on the ground who really care about the issues that are at stake here um everyone we met at Impala all this stuff like our driver Jackson was one of the most knowledgeable people I've ever met. He was so awesome. And I was like, why does this guy not have a PhD? This yeah, we opened this. We were like, Jackson needs a PhD. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so it, it's not that the, 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 research is, the research isn't coordinated because there's a lack of interest. It's just putting all of those pieces together. And that's really what we want to do with our project. Super. Thank you for those answers, guys. That's fantastic. Thanks, Pat, for the question as well. I'm going to uh, put maybe to Matt, because Matt works in Mozambique, and maybe you can share with us what happens there, and, and if you have any questions, you know, put it out here. Okay, thanks, Paula. Um, I think Dominique's on the line as well, so she should interrupt me if um, okay. I say anything wrong. But um, I, think, I think it's a really great idea. One question that I did have for you was how you would um, prioritize the different facets of this project in terms of Seem like the conference is one, one really big thing with the capacity building in terms of both the addition of the labs, um, but also the, the funding of, of fellowships um, was a really important part as well. Um, so yeah, I was wondering what you think about that. And um, I think there, there are some interesting models in Africa at the moment. South Africa, um, I think does a really good job of coordinating conservation research. Um, so they actually have a similar conference in Kruger National Park every year, which is uh, geared towards Savannah science. And so uh, at the conference side of things was going to be um, one of the primary goals, then maybe that's a place to look for ideas on how to implement it. Do you guys have a response? Yeah. Uh, wait, Madison, you go first. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was just taking a second to think about it. Um, this is a conversation that Emma and I have had a lot um, about how to prioritize what we're doing and when we're doing it. And I think this is one of those things that it's going to be a step at a time. Like we're thinking we have some short term goals, you know, starting this conference, starting to make those professional connections. Um, and then as there's more recognition and possibly more fundraising, then, you know, being able to support those longer term, um, you know, like scholarship or fellowship programs building research centers. Um, but, you know, we're, we're really hoping to take this project long term and we know that this isn't something we're going to bam do overnight. Um, Emma, if you'd like to, you know, add to that, that'd be great. Yeah, Madison definitely hit the nail on the head when it was like, this is a conversation we've had a lot because I think that there's like a lot, there are a lot of goals that like an overarching committee has, you know, and ultimately what, you know, many groups like that want to do is to change a culture. And that's like, really long time like that takes a little while but i think like the first step would be something like you suggest like fellowships like okay we garner some funding we um are pairing people uh we you know go to a university and say hey we would like to pair five of your students with you know uh five research groups like these kind of like small things so we can have these networks and over time through um finding people we host a conference and then like we take it kind of step by step to build like our network and influence. And when, as that happens, I have a feeling that more like donation money and things like that will be coming in. Um, but there are a lot of like smaller steps that we can take from the beginning to just kind of build our credibility as a group. <laughs> okay, I'm going to uh, invite Dominique to speak because Matt just drew my attention to her. Dominique is a scientist who works in Mozambique. She's from Mozambique. I hope that she's gonna agree to say something. <laughs> Hey, Dominique, can you hear me? She's muted. Oh, hold on. Dominique, uh, can you unmute yourself? Because I can't for some reason. Oh no, unfortunately I can't get her. Okay, I can't see, I can't uh, reach Dominique. What I'd like to do now is if there is any other um, questions I've, and I've got one comment from Frederick Onyancha who says good presentation from Emma and Madison looking forward to concrete engagement with all stakeholders to establish the advisory so yeah well done that's awesome um, and um, I'm 
I'm very conscious of the time. I promised everybody that uh, we would start on the next talk at 10 o'clock. It's now a quarter to 10. So what I'm going to do is to invite the Princeton students to take a break if you wish. And I'm going to invite Dr. Dino Martins to talk to those who stay on the line, because I hope you do stay on the line uh, for another 10 minutes. And then we will have the presentation by Max Gomera and his counterpart, Johannes Reiflesch, who are going to talk to us about coronavirus and zoonoses. But first, I thought it would be great to hear from Dino, just so that everybody on the line gets to know what is this Impala Research Center that we've just seen photographs of, but might look rather foreign to a lot of Kenyans who are on the line. Um, students, I just want to say thank you all so much. That's, those have been really phenomenal presentations. Well done, well done. And uh, we will share with you all the questions that have come in because there are people still waiting for their answers. And uh, congratulations, I know it was really hard to do all of this work in less than a week, but you've done a brilliant job. I, Matt, any, anything else that you feel? Exactly, two thumbs up. Well done, everyone. Okay, so you're, you're, um, you're free to take your break. And Dino, I'm going to unmute you so that you can now take us through what is Mpala. Students, of course, you can stay on the line as well. Well, Impala is this living laboratory, as we call it, and it's located in northern Kenya in Laikipia. It's 25 years old, and it was established as a partnership between Princeton University, the Smithsonian Institution, the Kenya Wildlife Service, and the National Museums of Kenya. And for the last 25 years, it's been involved primarily in research around animal behavior, savanna ecology, and more recently in One Health, in more applied work around water and soil and climate, and a lot of work on endangered species. And the Prince and Columbus students were here for the beginning of the semester and normally would have, would have spent the most of the semester here and then worked at other field sites like they worked with Paula for many years. Uh, this year was the second time we taught the genomics course and that's the first time that a field genomics course has been held in East Africa. And we made use of the lab, which we have the ability now at Impala to actually sequence genomes, DNA, to do stable isotopes. And this was a, a result of a, an international partnership. But as the students said, you know, one of the things they were able to do was, was sequence the uh, bongo uh, DNA, looking at the microbiome. And as many of the K Kenyans will know, there's less than 100 bongo left. And so every single bongo is incredibly precious. And the wonderful thing is it was not just the students doing this as a data project. They were able to share that information with the people who manage the bongos, who care for them, the keepers, the wardens on a day-to-day -day basis. And so what I'd, I'd love to see more of is we build a feedback loop between research and management so that we actually take the lessons we we should publish papers and, and that's an important part of science, but we also need to feed into management. There are some, there are some challenges. I think the students uh, touched on this. One of the aspects we're really challenged by is a very complex regulatory environment. You know, it's complicated for Kenyans and it's complicated for international scientists. And I think we really need to make sure we're enabling research and not stifling it. And, and the flip side of this is we should not be making any decision about wildlife and conservation and biodiversity without evidence. All our decisions should be guided by, by evidence. So, so Impala is, is here, we're doing fine. We're also kind of locked down. We don't have any students or sci international scientists on the campus at present. The lab is, is kind of closed. But the long-term research on wildlife tracking animals, on livestock, grazing experiments, uh, experimental plots, all of that is ongoing. So we're, we're looking forward to getting things back up and running at some point uh, in the near future. Maybe so, I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. I'm, I'm going to ask you to say just one more thing because you launched in it, assuming that everybody on the air knows 
uh, where Impala is and what it is. You said it's a living laboratory. Tell us about the actual place. Like, we don't know anything. Impa how big is Impala? Okay, so Impala is located in, in Laikipia County, that's north of Mount Kenya. And it is on a conservancy that's about 50,000 acres of land. Uh, but it works works at a much broader level. We work on all the in all the neighboring areas on land. We work a lot with communities. Uh, we have projects that stretch all the way into other parts of northern Kenya, even into other countries. So yeah, so that's that's basically what it is. It's an NGO. So we're a trust that's formed by the different trustee organizations. And having turned 25 years last year into this year, we're now just about to launch a very different model going forward where we really want to empower and enable more Kenyan and African scientists to come here and benefit from training and capacity building and get being mentored and learning and sharing and teaching. And, I'm, and very sadly, one of the things we've had to cancel for this year is that we had a course plan for 20 different African countries, students from 20 different African countries to participate in a field biology course, including in genomics and how can you use these new tools. And I'm hoping that we can get that up and running next year. But one of, one of the things I think we're, we're all facing right now is all of our models of all of these systems, whether it's in tourism or research or in many other fields were based and are based on international exchanges that involve international travel, they involve, you know, a lot of movement and, and also a flow of financing that comes primarily from donors in the U US and Europe. If that goes away, I don't think we've yet fully understood how we will we'll manage conservation. I think it's a time for us to rethink uh, what Paula and I have talked a lot about is what are our values? What do we value? You know, we're not going to stop looking after wildlife and biodiversity just because there are no tourists or there are no scientists. We, we have responsibility and, and stewardship over this incredible resource that is, that is gifted to us. It's, you know, it's not owned by any one person. And as, as, as we can build that bigger value system, I'd see the economic part of it as being one component, but just one component. And that surely, you know, as, as human beings being so, so amazingly adept and, and clever, we can come up with a broader system that allows protected areas, allows conservancies, allows communities to, to work with nature and to conserve nature. And I think one of the things we really need to do is figure out that value. So science and the generation of knowledge is a really important value. Uh, one of the projects that was done at Impala that was unfortunately stopped because the funding was stopped was on coronaviruses. Following the major Ebola pandemic, President Obama funded a whole bunch of scientists around the world, including here at Impala, to do surveillance of coronaviruses so that when the next pandemic occurred, we would be prepared with enough sequences and natural history and epidemiological data to solve the problem more efficiently. That program was stopped last year. It's just been revived because of the crisis. It's, it's a global program, but it's also, it's still not clear what when and how and you know who's going to be able to do it because we're also facing this situation where movement and everything else is restricted. So, so we sort of, if we don't invest in science and we don't invest in knowledge, we, we do it at our peril. You know, without, without basic information, we, we, we basically, we face these, these problems. Thank you for that, Dino. I'm going to ask one question um, is to, to tell all the people on, because there are a lot of young Kenyans who are on, many scientists from various universities around Kenya. Uh, how, how does a, a scientist or a student or a teacher or a professor get to come to Impala and work at Impala, and take advantage of these incredible world-class laboratories, scientists, research, um, publications, and all that stuff? Not to so, mention the place itself. Yeah. 
most most of most students come here through a university program so we have university of nairobi karatina universities uh, other many universities around the world so typically our students are university students and they're doing a research project or part of a field course or participating in a study abroad program or working on a senior thesis or or you know volunteering or in doing an internship we would like to build more citizen science projects and work we've done with wildlife direct for example is bringing younger students not just university students and allowing them the opportunity to really get a hands-on experience in the field now we'd need to do a lot more of that and and i wouldn't say just at impala all parks and reserves should be open to the idea of bringing in people to learn and explore, to do bio blitzes, to take pictures, to do citizen science. We should build that as one of the things we just do routinely going forward and not just say, okay, the parks are re you know, really just for tourism. Well, tourism is great, but there's lots and lots of other people and other ways in which those protected areas can be used and can be valued. Okay, we have a question from Kiama, who I'm not sure if you know him, Kiama Kara. Yeah. His question is, hi, Dr. Dino, say something about Impala Live. Thanks. Uh, yes, so Impala Live is a, an online platform. It is a live cam. You can watch wildlife uh, during the day. There's even a night vision camera now. It's been a bit challenged because of the rain, but it is up and running and the flooding of the river. Uh, 45 million people are, are, are on it uh, watching and you can make comments but more importantly there's a curriculum on it for, for primary grade school children both for the US system and the Kenyan system so if anyone wants in to use that they can go in it's completely free and it, it's available and you know enjoy it and, and the, the, usually it's the hippos and other animals are there performing every day awesome great well thank you so much Thank I'm going you. to now. I'm going to now say thank you to everyone, Princeton, Dino. That that's been really amazing, and of course to our audience. 